In our first session, we covered uh, an awful lot of history, um, AD 312 through to around AD 1790, a period of around 1,500 years. And we perhaps sometimes wonder at the great lengths of time that God's prophetic plan is outworked. Uh, and during those centuries, the great suffering on his people, those that have tried to keep the truth and remain true to the commandments of our Lord and Master. And I'm sure all of us have pondered from time to time why we are here in 2018 and why Christ has not returned. Because whilst some of the events of world history, as revealed in the book of Revelation, happened very slowly over very long periods of time, what we, I'd suggest, see now, today, in the times in which we're living, is, is a speeding up. We're seeing events happening on a, a quicker and, and faster uh, scale. And it perhaps reminds us of the words of our master in Matthew 24, where he said, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall um, be shortened. Now, before we go and look at the third great earthquake in uh, Revelation that we've just read. I'd like us to start our thoughts um, in this session by going back to the Old Testament, to the book of Joshua and the sixth chapter. It's a chapter that we know uh, very well. It's a um, well-known Sunday school story. It, of course, is the Battle of Jericho. Um, but I believe that this uh, episode here in, in Joshua 6, in many ways, sets the, the structure um, for the book of Revelation, and in, in particular, a, a structure relating to, to the earthquake, and in particular, the earthquake at the end. Now, we know this story really well. Um, Israel had crossed the Jordan, uh, they'd entered the Promised Land, and now their task was to conquer and to subdue the land. And we know who the leader is, Joshua chapter 6, verse 12, and Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the Ark of the Lord. So we, had, we have our leader, we have Joshua, who, of course, is a type of the Lord Jesus. Their name means the same, Yahweh's saviour. And I want you to note in verse 13 that we have, and seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went on continuing in blue with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them, but the re-reward came after the Ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpet. So we have seven priests and, and seven trumpets of, of ram's horns. And we know that the number seven is the number of completion. And you can't help but fail to notice how many times in the book of Revelation the number seven occurs over and over again. The seven letters, the seven seals, the seven vials, and so on and so forth. And in verse 14, we're given the details of uh, them going round the city, of course, in verse 14. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp. So they did six days. So for six days they compassed this city of man, this city of Jericho. And perhaps denoting for us the 6,000 years that are given to Gentile rule, man's time, the kingdoms of men upon this earth. But on the seventh day, there's a great change, isn't there? There's a change in intensity and in activity. Look at verse 15. It came to pass on the seventh day that it rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they compassed the city seven times. So on the seventh day, they go around the city seven times. There's a, a great increase in activity. And it was on the seventh time on this seventh day that the walls of this city were to fall down flat. Look at verse 16. It came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Uh, it's repeated in verse 20. So the people shouted with the priest, blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. So it was at this time, the seventh time on the seventh day, 
that the walls fell flat. And then I would suggest it was an earthquake that would have caused this to happen. It was when this earthquake happened that the city was compromised, that Joshua and the people could gain access and the establishment of Israel in the promised land uh, could begin because Jericho was that first city that they were to take. Now there were some requirements um, that were needed when this city was taken. Uh, We've got one of them in verse uh, 19. Uh, But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the silver and the gold, that belong to God. I'd like you just to make a mental note of that. We'll come back to that uh, later. And, of course, we know that Rahab and her house uh, were saved. That was the one part of the city walls that didn't fall. What was it that saved Rahab? Well, it was her faith, wasn't it? That she was saved out of the city because of her faith. And then finally, um, the city was burnt uh, with fire. Verse 24, and they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. So we've got this pattern of sevens, um, which speeds up as we get towards the end. And then we have this final destruction, um, the walls falling flat, um, which we suggest was by an earthquake. And we have this similar structure in the book of Revelation. We start with the seven letters, then we have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials, and then uh, the seven thunders. And we saw in the first two sessions that those great political earthquakes, the the change in in man's religion, if you like, and if you remember anything from this afternoon, if we can associate the earthquakes with that in a change of thinking or change of perspective um, in the kingdoms of men. So the first one was uh, that change from paganism to the apostate Christian church to the Catholic church under Constantine at the end of the sixth seal. The second one was uh, that change from the rulership of the monarchy and the power of the uh, Catholic Church to the way that we're more familiar with people thinking today. People power and and democracy, um, those humanistic ideas which has spread throughout this world. And then what we're shortly to consider is this greatest of all uh, earthquakes, which occurs at the end of the seventh vial, when the kingdoms of men, people power, is replaced by the kingdom of God and the rule of Christ and the saints. And, and we'll comment on the thunders perhaps in a, in a few moments. But after all of each of these earthquakes, we have this vision of the kingdom. So you could align all of these um, earthquakes together if you compressed Um, the the book of Revelation in that sort of telescopic uh, structure that we we thought about earlier. Okay, so let's go back to Revelation chapter 16 then and let's see how this great earthquake uh, builds. Because we're in the the period of the sixth vial and this brings us right up to date. This is the time period that we are living in now. So what do we read? Well, verse 12 of Revelation chapter 16. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. The water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirit of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God. Almighty. So we have these three unclean spirits like frogs. Now, the frogs is a symbol of the French. Um, it's a, a page, front page of the Bible magazine from a few years ago. Um, there we have uh, Clovis, um, who ruled parts of northern. France, and you can see very clearly that uh, King Clovis, that he had uh, as his symbol um, that of the frog. 
and over time that symbol changed to the uh, fleur-de-lis. Um, but if you went out into the street today and if you asked anybody in the street which nation was representative by the frogs, everybody would tell you it is, of course, the French. It's something that we are very familiar with. But we're told that this is an unclean spirit like frogs, and there are three of them. So what is this? Well, it's that change that we saw in the second earthquake. It's that great cry of liberty, equality, fraternity. It's the spirit of the power to man, power to the people, the power of humanism, that power that has spread throughout almost the whole earth. And when we think about it, this spirit has done great things. It's, it's brought down walls. So we can think of the Berlin Wall, for example, that was brought about by this spirit. It's called great revolutions. It's thrown down governments. And we still see this same spirit at work today. Now, specifically, we're told that this spirit comes out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. Now, I'm sure you've done themes or are doing themes uh, through Revelation on these, so we'll only briefly uh, mention them. Uh, the dragon is that old pagan Roman Empire symbol, um, now uh, manifested in, in Russia. Uh, the beast is uh, more to do with Europe in the West, so those European uh, kings, those European nations. And then we have the, the false prophet, which is the, the false religion, um, the Pope and the Catholic Church. And these spirits go out throughout the whole world to gather the kings of the earth at the end of verse 14 to the great day of God Almighty. Now this uh, same spirit accords with the prophecy that we have in the book of Daniel. Can we come back to Daniel chapter 2, please? That really well-known uh, prophecy. We'll all have heard many Sunday night lectures on it. And uh, it's that great description of the kingdoms of men, or kingdom of men, I should say. Nebuchadnezzar's uh, image, a dream that he had. And you'll all be familiar with the successive world empires that this image uh, represents. But I want us to go and focus right in at the end, just before the stone hits the image on the feet. What is the condition of this uh, image? Well, verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So there's still that Roman Empire influence uh, in the feet, but it's very unstable, it's mixed with clay, it's a very unsure foundation. Verse 42, and as the toes and the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly broken. And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. So it's this phrase here, that they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Because this image starts with a complete autocracy, doesn't it? It starts with King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of kings, that he had supreme power, supreme rulership. And we're now down to the feet, this very unstable mix of iron and clay. It doesn't mix well together. And it's mingled with the seed of men. It's mingled with the spirit of democracy. And today we're in the age of, of coalition governments, aren't we? We're in the age where things are uh, politically held together by a thread. You know, we only have to look at our own country to see how fragile our governments are. The Western governments could be overturned in a moment. And when they go to the polls, it's often a 50-50 split, isn't it, on how the uh, political parties are... Uh, voted in. But all these things, uh, this unstable mix, this spirit of, of democracy, all these things are bringing about the gathering of the nations. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 16. <clears throat> Would you mind passing the glass, please, Richard? Sorry. That's great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so Revelation chapter 16, and um, we'll end of verse 14 again. It's to gather them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And then verse 16, there's exhortation for us in verse 15. But verse 16, and he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So all these things are happening to bring about Armageddon, that battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now much has been said about uh, Armageddon and the meaning of um, the word. Uh, Brother Thomas um, suggests that the correct way of understanding Armageddon is uh, that it means a heap of sheaves in a valley of judgment. And he splits the word up into three constituent parts. Armour meaning heap, gay meaning valley, and don meaning judgment. A heap of sheaves in a valley of of judgment and it, and it corresponds to the stone striking the image on the feet doesn't it of, of Daniel chapter 2 language and how that image crashes to the ground and then that stone grows and eventually fills the whole earth relating to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and of course many passages in the Old Testament that also speak of this great event let's go back to Joel's prophecy and the third chapter. Joel chapter 3 and um, verse 14 for connection. Where it says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And the word decision there, it's better translated as threshing so it's the valley of threshing or the valley of judgment heap of sheaves in a valley of judgment for the day of the lord is near in the valley of decision or the valley of threshing and look at verse 15 the sun and the moon shall be darkened the stars shall withdraw their shining the lord also shall roar out of zion and utter his voice from jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake but the lord will be the hope of the people and the strength of the children of Israel. So there's a great shaking of the earth and the heavens as we have here in Joel chapter 3. It's very similar to the language that we've seen already, isn't it, in the book of Revelation, that great change in political power. But it's not just at this earthquake, political change that's being referred to, but there are prophecies that talk about a great literal earthquake as well. Let's go to uh, Ezekiel chapter 38, which is one of those uh, prophecies. Ezekiel 38, that great chapter about the Gog armies coming down against the mountains of Israel and the intervention by the Lord Jesus Christ on God's behalf. And in verse 19 of uh, Ezekiel 38, we read, and in the In my jealousy and the fire of my uh, wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Now this is talking about a truly huge earthquake something that's of an unprecedented scale major earthquakes cause damage to buildings but this earthquake we're told that every wall shall fall to the ground and we've got further details of exactly what's going to bring about um, this uh, earthquake in uh, Zechariah's uh, prophecy let's go over to Zechariah chapter 14 let's see some more details of this great physical earthquake that's going to occur at the return of the Lord Jesus. And we can pinpoint the exact time in which this earthquake will take place. As it says, after all nations come against Jerusalem to battle in verse 2, in verse 4 of Zechariah 14, and his feet, and that's the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, The Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great mountain, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward 
the south. So at the moment, um, the Mount of Olives is higher than uh, Zion. It's higher than the, the Dome of the Rock across the, uh, the valley uh, there. And um, geologists have actually found a fault line that runs through uh, the Mount of Olives, which will split north to south, as uh, predicted by this prophecy. Um, this is Brother Sully's um, uh, depiction of Ezekiel's temple um, in his book and he denotes the fault line through the Mount of Olives uh, up there on the right hand side. So this mountain is going to split and it's going to be something that's on an unprecedented scale. Let's carry on reading in verse 5 and he shall flee to the valley of the mountains and the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. So there's this historical reference to an earthquake in the days of Uzziah. Now this is um, mentioned in Amos chapter 1 and verse 1. We won't turn to it. But it's about 200 years before this earthquake in Uzziah's time. Um, when Zechariah said, you'll flee like as you fled in the days of the earthquake in Uzziah. Now, nobody on the earth today talks about an earthquake in any detail as something that happened 200 years ago. But they were still talking about the earthquake in Uzziah's time 200 years later. Well, why? Why were they talking about it? What happened with Uzziah? Well, we won't turn to it. You'll know the story with Uzziah. Um, he was uh, a king, king of Israel. Um, towards the end of his reign, he became very proud. And he took on the role of a priest. And he went into the temple to try and offer incense. And you remember the priest tried to stop him doing that. And when he went in to offer that incense, he became leprous. Now, it's Josephus that suggests, some secular writing, but um, uh, it would fit the pattern. Josephus suggests that when he offered incense, it was at this point this great earthquake happened and the, the temple walls uh, split and a, and a crack of light uh, appeared through the wall of the temple and it was at the point that the light struck Isaiah that he became leprous. Now, we don't know whether that actually happened or not, but it would certainly have been around the same time. So what we have here is the punishment on a king in not keeping God's commands. He was entering into a false way of worship, a false system of worship, and he was punished as a result for that by becoming leprous, and he was leprous to the day that he died. And we've got this analogy in Zechariah back to that event. We have further details as to what's going to happen to the land. Look at verse 10 of Zechariah 14. Where we read, and all the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to women, south of Jerusalem. It shall be lifted up and inhabited in a place from Benjamin's gate into the place of the first gate, into the corner gate, from the Tower of Hananiel, into the king's wine presses. There's quite a lot to take in there. Let's try and uh, break it down. It mentions the plain, that the land will be turned into a plain. Now, in the revised version, it says the Araba. And the Araba is this depression here uh, to the south of the Dead Sea. That's the Araba. And it then tells us that um, a whole area of land is going to be lifted up from Geba to Rimmon. Now, Geba to Rimmon, um, River Geba six miles north of Jerusalem, Rimmon's 33 miles to the southwest of Jerusalem. So we've got this approximate 40-mile area that's going to be lifted up and made like a great plain like uh, the Araba. And that's a huge geological change. This whole mountainous area is going to be lifted up even further. We don't know exactly uh, what it will be like. It might be like um, Tabletop Mountain, for example, in South Africa. That might be the geological change that happens. But the whole purpose of this is to elevate Mount Zion. It's currently lower than Olivet, uh, but after the earthquake, Mount Zion will be raised much higher. So Psalms like uh, Psalm 48 verse 2, uh, we normally sing, beautiful 
The situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the side of the north. The revised version says beautiful in elevation. Zion is going to be elevated. Um, Well-known passage for us, Isaiah 2, verse 2. um, The Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. So there's this elevation of Mount Zion where... God's temple, Ezekiel's temple, is going to be constructed. And all nations will go up to that house of prayer uh, to worship the Lord God. So there's going to be this great geological change that's brought about as a result of a massive earthquake. Now, there has been some very recent earthquakes in Israel. And a couple of weeks ago, um, this article was published. I don't know if anybody of you, any of you saw it. Uh, experts in, uh, in Israel are predicting a major earthquake. Experts warn major earthquakes soon, and they, they think a major earthquake in Israel happens about once every 100 years. And it's really interesting that the high risk zone for this earthquake in the red is exactly where Zechariah's prophecy predicts. And we know it's going to be the greatest earthquake that this world has ever seen. So the Bible talks about a great physical earthquake beyond the Richter scale, massive destruction of buildings, sadly huge loss of life. The consequences will be far reaching, there'll be the collapse of world trade, banking, commerce will be no more, there'll be chaos, panic worldwide, the world leaders will be clueless. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 16 because... Is this the earthquake that's really being referred to in the seventh vial? Well, I'd suggest that there is a subtle difference. So in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 17, we read, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. So this is after... Armageddon. So there's this great cry of, it is done. Keep a mark from Revelation 16 and come back with me to Ezekiel 39. This is a direct quote from Ezekiel's um, prophecy. And it's a quote that comes after the destruction of Gog on the mountains of Israel. Momentarily lost Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel 39 and uh, so this is after the great earthquake of the end of chapter 38 it's after the fire in the land of Magog in verse 6 and it's verse 8 we want to look at of Ezekiel 39 behold it is come and it is done saith the Lord God this is the day whereof I have spoken so The consequences of the earthquake are tied in with this great earthquake of Revelation chapter 16. But I suggest to you that what Revelation 16 is really talking about, in line with the other great earthquakes of Revelation, is a change that's not literal, but one that's symbolic. It's the overthrow of peoples and political powers, although it's very closely aligned. The consequence of the great earthquake helped bring about this political change, this great earthquake political change that takes place on the earth. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 16. We've got the description of it. We're told in the middle of verse 18, there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the language is emphatic, isn't it? This is the greatest earthquake that has ever happened on earth. The earth. It's the greatest political earthquake ever. As the stone strikes the image on the feet, it breaks it to pieces. As the chaff as the summer threshing floor, and it becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. It's similar language to Daniel 12, isn't it? A time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And so the political and the religious change that's going to be brought about by the return of the Lord Jesus is far, far greater than what Constantine brought in and far, far greater than that of the French Revolution. So let's see what happens. Uh, Verse 19 of Revelation 16. And the great city 
was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So the great city, that city of Rome that we looked at in our first sessions, is divided into three parts and I suggest that those three parts are the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. And these few verses here are really a summary of what Revelation reveals to us in the next few chapters. So um, chapters 17 and 18 of Revelation is the destruction of Babylon the Great, of the, of the whore. Uh, Revelation 19 gives us the details of the beast and the false prophet cast into the lake of fire. And uh, Revelation 20 gives us the details of the dragon, uh, that old serpent, also cast into the lake of fire. And I'm sure you're covering that in your, in your other studies. Um, so we won't comment on them specifically. But this takes time. It says that the cities of the nations fell and that um, verse 20 and every island fled away and the mountains were not found. So what is this referring to? That every island uh, fled away? Well, Come back with me to Genesis chapter 10, if you will. Let's have a think about what these islands uh, represent. In Genesis chapter 10, we've got the dividing of the nations according to the descendants of Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And uh, in verse 2, we've got the sons of Japheth, the European nations, Goma, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Chiraz, and so forth. Then in verse 5, we're told by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. So the isles of the Gentiles, these are talking about nations, um, such as Britain, uh, for example. We are an island nation. What about the mountains not being found? Well, come with me to Jeremiah chapter 51. So in Jeremiah chapter 51, we've got... Babylon, ancient Babylon, described as a mountain. Jeremiah 51, verse 25. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyest all the earth, and I'll stretch out mine hand upon thee and fall thee down from the rocks, and I'll make thee a burnt uh, mountain. So the mountains are used to describe nations. And here we've got the islands fleeing away and the mountains not being found. So it's the nations becoming subservient to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've got little snippets of prophecies, haven't we, as to how this is going to uh, outwork. Um, We won't turn to it. Ezekiel 39, verse 6, talks about a fire in the land of Magog. Um, So specific destruction on uh, that uh, area. Uh, Can we go to Isaiah chapter 2, please? Because we've got details of what's going to happen to... um, to all nations, but to one nation in particular. Um, Tarshish is mentioned, so I believe that is Britain uh, today. Uh, Isaiah 2, verse 11 uh, says, The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And then we're given the details of how the pride of the nations are going to be brought low. Verse 15, and upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures, the loftiness of men shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So there's a suppressing of the nations, and the Lord Jesus Christ exalted. I want you to note the language here in Isaiah 2. Look at verse 19, it says, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Now you'll recognise that language from the first earthquake, from the time of Constantine. You remember how we said that the pagans, they had to hide themselves away because they had to get used to a whole new way of, of worship, a whole new way of religion. And we think about it when the Lord Jesus Christ returns people today that don't accept God 
that have believed in evolution all their life or that think that the Pope is God's representative on earth, they're going to have a huge shock, aren't they? That their mindset is going to have to change completely and they're going to hide themselves in the holes of the rocks and the caves of the earth because they'll be so confused about what is happening. Humanism will no longer be an acceptable world view. Look at verse 20. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. So today the uh, nations of the world spend so much time seeking after money, after uh, material goods of gold and silver. And the picture we're given here is they're given to the moles and to the bats. They're, They're worthless. They're of no use whatsoever. Verse 21, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly um, the earth. And this is something that the nations aren't given a choice of, is it? So we won't turn to these passages, um, but we're told in Zechariah 14 that if Egypt doesn't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, that they'll be punished with a plague and with a uh, famine. But there are nations that we're told that do accept the Lord Jesus Christ, that do offer obeisance to him. Uh, Tarshish is one of those, the kings of Tarshish, Sheba and Seba. After they've been humbled, will offer gifts to the king. And uh, we're told about some of the Arab nations in Isaiah chapter 60 uh, doing the same thing. But let's go back to uh, Revelation, Revelation chapter 16. Because the details here are, we've got scant details, um, but want to note in verse 18 that with this great earthquake, that there are voices and thunders and lightning. So there are other things that are happening at this same time. Can you come back a few pages, please, to Revelation chapter 10? Because there's a section of the book of Revelation that we don't have the details of. It was shown to John, but he was told not to write it down. And I think it relates to this period that we're looking at. Verse 1 of Revelation chapter 10. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. And his face was it were the sun, and the feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. So the picture that we have is the the rainbowed angel, so Christ and the saints, right foot on the sea, sea is symbolic of nations, so the subduing of the nations, and his left foot on the earth, so it's a subduing of the nations of the earth. And in verse 3, he cries with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, and when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write... And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal at those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So we suggest that the seven thunders follow after the seven vials. And they occur at the establishment of the kingdom. So it's as Jesus and the saints begin the process of taking control of this whole earth. Now, John was told not to write them down and they're not to be written down because Jesus will actually be here when we see them outworked and revealed to us. There is perhaps a little clue in scripture as to what these seven thunders are all about. Can you come back with me, please, to Psalm 29? So I think there's a a really lovely link here with the earthquakes. Psalm 29 we have seven proclamations of God. They're contained from verse 3 down to verse 9. And they each start with the voice of the Lord. So verse 3, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The glory of God thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. And then it repeats again, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Now the word voice in the Hebrew, it can be translated as thunder. We won't turn to it because of time, but Exodus chapter 9 verse 28 is a really good 
uh, example of that, where this word, normally translated as voice, is actually translated as thunder, the thunder of the Lord. So what we have here is seven thunders of the Lord. And it starts upon the waters. And we said that the waters is symbolic of, of nations. It's the subduing of the nations. The thunder of the Lord is powerful. It's full of majesty. It breaks the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon, that pride of man. And we read about that in Isaiah chapter 2. We've got the voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. Fire being symbolic of, of judgment, that fire in the land of, of Magog. Then look at verse 8. The sixth thunder, the voice of the Lord, the thunder of the Lord, shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. Isn't that interesting that it's the sixth thunder? Just as the great earthquake occurred in the sixth seal, it occurred in the sixth trumpet. And here we have a suggestion of a earthquake in the sixth thunder in the wilderness of Kadesh, the place where the spies were sent out to spy out the land. It's the area to the south of the Araba. It's here the Lord shakes the wilderness, perhaps referring to those that have fled to the clefts of the rocks, those that have gone to the holes and the caves of the earth, that God will shake those places as well. So great are the judgments of the Almighty. And um, the end of this uh, shaking is that the Lord is in his temple and everyone speaks of his glory. That house of prayer established in the top of the mountains in, in Mount uh, Zion. Let's go to Haggai chapter 2. Let's try and apply these things to ourselves as we and draw our thoughts to a conclusion. There are these great events, this terrible shaking that's going to happen on the earth. And God, through the prophet Haggai, in chapter 2 and verse 6 says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Now what is the desire of the nations? Well, the desire of the nations today is wickedness, isn't it? That's what the nations desire today. And perhaps a better translation is the excellency of the nations. They shall come. And what is the excellency of the nations? Well, the excellency of the nations are the saints. It's those who have kept the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does God say in verse 8? He says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember what God said was to happen in Jericho? The silver and the gold would be his, it would be to be kept to the treasury. Well, here God's saying that the silver and the gold is his. What God is interested in is faith. He's interested in the faith that comes out from the nations, those that have aligned themselves to him, made possible through the silver of redemption, through the work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as God will shake the nations at the return of his son, our lives will be shaken, brothers and sisters, because we will have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. And God's not interested in the things of this world that we spend so much of our time uh, getting involved with. He's interested in the silver and the gold, those things that remain. So we need to focus our lives to make sure that we develop those characteristics that are worthy to him. So should we fear? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 8. I know how time's going. I'd like to share this little thought with you. Matthew chapter 8. We said at the start of our first talk that there was an earthquake that we missed from the New Testament. And I think it's here in, in Matthew chapter 8. Let's have a look at verse 23. It says, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, and pulled there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered 
with the waves, but he was asleep. Now, we know this story really well, don't we? Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, this great tempest that arose. But interestingly, this word tempest, it's the Greek word seismos. And every other time in the New Testament, it's translated as earthquake translated 13 times of earthquake and this once here as a tempest and I think what's happening here is actually a tsunami there was an earthquake in this in this region and it created a very unusual conditions on the Sea of Galilee and it's interesting that seismologists today are predicting an earthquake in this area that they reckon the epicenter of the next great earthquake in Israel is going to be in the Sea of Galilee we think it's a bit further south but put that up uh, as it may But we know from uh, this tempest that the disciples who were experienced fishermen, they feared greatly. Look at verse 25. And his disciples came to him and awake him, saying, Lord, save us. We perish. This was no ordinary storm on Galilee. The the disciples would have seen many storms on Galilee, but this was something very different. Verse 26. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little flakes? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. And we know that the sea is representative of the nations. And there there will be this great shaking of the nations. But Jesus will bring about that calm on the nations. Just as he brought about that calm on Galilee. And just as he was able to still the fear in his disciples. If we put our trust in him, that we have no reason to fear and Jesus will establish that great peace that great calm upon the earth Revelation chapter 4 let's bring it back to the apocalypse Revelation chapter 4 another wonderful vision of the kingdom Uh, Revelation 4 verse 6 and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four living creatures full of eyes before and behind and this is the picture of Jesus in glory the nations as a sea of glass perfectly calm before him and that's God's plan and purpose isn't it with this earth that his glory might fill the earth that this earth might be changed from a worship of the ways of man spirit of humanism to a worship of the Lord God Almighty. Whoops, sorry, let's put that passage up. So um, let's conclude by Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 27. And this word, yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken. This is a quote from Haggai's prophecy. As of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Brethren and sisters, we're living in the last days. This earth is going to see the greatest shaking, both physically and politically, that it has ever experienced. The world as we know it is passing away with this great earthquake which is brought about by the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to focus on the things that remain, the things of God, the things of faith, the things of truth, and look forward to the return of our Lord and Master. Thank you.